Hi, my name's Justin Coletti. Thanks for coming to MixCon. I've got to tell you, when I was growing up in the 90s, whenever a really cool piece of art came out that you just had to know about, it was almost always a record. And I think in the past decade, most of the times when someone tells me about a new piece of art that I've got to check out, it's almost always a TV show. Maybe it's a movie, maybe it's even a video game. And the first guy we have today has worked in all three of those formats. He's worked on TV shows, Doctor Who, recording scores, He's done an episode of Black Mirror. He's worked in film, the latest Star Wars movie, Solo, uh, doing scores for that. Oh, Game World, Assassin's Creed. That's a big one. Any fans here of Assassin's Creed? Anybody know this? All right, a couple. How about Black Mirror fans? Anyone? I thought that would get a big one. Hey, Doctor Who? All right. The guy who we're going to bring up on stage has worked with on all of those projects He's come all the way from the UK. Before I introduce him, I want to give a big thanks to our sponsor for his presentation. In addition to mixing scores for all sorts of major motion pictures, he's actually recorded orchestral libraries that you can use in your own work. And he's done that for a great company called Spitfire Audio. And they are sponsoring this, helping to make this free to the public. So big round of applause, please, Spitfire Audio. All right, without further ado, Man of the Hour, Mr. Jake Jackson. Hello there. Can you hear me? Yes, you can. Hi, how are you doing? Good. Thanks for having me in New York. Thanks for Justin. Thanks, Justin. Thanks a bit for our audio. Um, here we are. Uh, it's exciting to come over. I hope you can understand my English accent. <laughs> um, I'll do my best to speak slowly, because um, that's what my American clients say. That's the biggest issue they have with me, is I speak too fast, so I shall speak slowly and uh, as clear as I can. Um, yeah, thanks for having me, thanks um, for that. What Justin said, really, I started 20 years ago um, at Air Studios, George Martin's studio in, in London, a very traditional kind of um, career. I started as a runner, T-boy, didn't know that much about film soundtracks, turned up at the studio in Air and realised it's the most incredible space where we record... Um, orchestras of 100 musicians down to, you know, big studio bands and stuff. Started loving working on soundtracks and, and did that, really. It was a, a tape op with, you know, proper tape for about eight years and then became uh, an engineer freelance now, but still managed by air. So, yeah, I work on uh, TV, soundtrack, movies. Um, my kind of big break was uh, working with uh, Nick Cave and Warren Ellis on their soundtracks, and I've done about a dozen movies with them, and that's less orchestral and more kind of bandy and cool, which is nice, and um, that's kind of fun. So as computer games have grown and budgets have kind of grown for computer games, we, I do scores for that, like we said Assassin's Creed. I'm in, uh, back, and my flight this evening is uh, so I can be back uh, for a session on Monday morning in, in uh, London for a, for a new um, VR Sony game. So. It's, uh, it's a pretty hectic schedule, but it's rather exciting. And so when I'm not recording an orchestra, I'm mixing. And so mixing in the olden days used to be at the studio, but now, you know, as we all know, it's become in the box, particularly for soundtracks. That means I've got a little studio in my back garden, 5.1 studio uh, running Logic and Pro Tools. And um, it's changed my life in the last few months. It's quite extraordinary, really. I can get to see my family, yet I still go to the studio sometimes. So it's really nice. So I'm going to try and give you some, some pearls of wisdom for those guys who are starting to mix or composers, just so I understand who I'm talking to. How many of you guys are composers and here to learn about, a bit more about um, mixing at, with your own compositions? Cool, a good bunch of you. And then the rest of you, or the other, is that a bunch of who are mixers, is that right? And then I guess there's some other people who are just interested, so <laughs> that's cool. Um, I'm going to talk mainly, um, in that case, well, I probably was going anyway, but I shall certainly talk as if I'm talking to a composer um, and, and, a, and, a, and an inexperienced mixer about delivering um, a mix. Um, I'm, just, I'm working today in stereo, because obviously we're in stereo. The rules apply for stereo and surround. Um, but I'm going to talk about a mix 
and a mixed template for purely for audio at this stage, because it's easier on this stage not to have any uh, in virtual instruments. But um, the same rules apply, and of course, if you're if you're bounce, you can use you know you can bounce it out yourself or or whatever. So, but I'm also going to talk about stems because I think that's quite important for delivery of uh, soundtrack material these days. It's not just a you know you very rarely deliver a, a stereo or surround mix. You need to deliver a bunch of stems. So I'm going to go into my template for that and explain why I do certain things and what's a good what's good for your template to have set up because you for a, for a soundtrack mix you can have a really pretty detailed setup with let's you know I'm using seven stems today um, that said that that should last you for most of your of your delivery requirements so that's what I'll do um, what makes a uh, a good film score mix obviously uh, good music helps um, and then I like to think a kind of realistic balance is quite important for this kind of thing, particularly if we're talking orchestral. I'm, I'm going to talk about, uh, just to clarify, I'm going to be talking about a, 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 an orchestral-based uh, soundtrack today. A lot of these rules will work out if you've got, um, you know, guitars, instruments, classical, but it's, it's, it's essentially a kind of real instrument uh, mix. I've got um, a uh, mix, in fact, from a computer game I've uh, mixed a while ago uh, from the Total War Saga, Thrones of Britannia, and it's uh, one, of the, one of the titles of that. So I've got a bit of video to go with it too, which is quite nice, you can see that. So I guess we should probably um, have a look at it, really. All the uh, black and white um, tracks are bounces of virtual instruments. Uh, they don't say which, bra which uh, library they are. Some are Spitfire, I think some are um, East West, and some are Cine samples and all of the other libraries that I haven't uh, mentioned. There we go. Uh, this is all those. I've got various different string bounces, some uh, ethnic percussion, some brass. You can see it all right there. Um, and then we've got some real recordings as well, because why not? It sounds nice. And hopefully, um, if you guys are composers, then you'll have some real instruments in there. I think it really helps to make a mix just stand out a little bit, even if you can only afford to have one violinist playing along with a fake orchestra. It really helps to just give it a little bit of sense. It, drag, it, it just it grabs the attention of the ear. So I would strongly recommend that if you are having to deliver a, um, a sampled-based mix, then do where you can throw in a real instrument. Maybe it's yourself playing some, a cymbal or um, getting someone to sing along with a fake choir or something, just to have there. I think it really, it's really important, and it, it's amazing what a tiny bit will do to trick the ear into thinking the whole thing sounds more realistic. So we've got some choir here, we've got some solo vocals here, then we've got a string recording, which I believe this was done in Europe, um, in Prague, I think. I, I wasn't involved in the recording of this, um, so I was sent this by the guys at, in Prague. Put it in, so there's, two, there's this green one is the uh, main string section. You can see I've got um, some tree mics, the left, centre, right, some outriggers, LLRR um, surrounds, and then various close mics on, the, on, um, on, on for each section. Again, if you um, do a remote session with Europe or you do a recording session here in New York or Los Angeles or wherever, this is the kind of typical um, mic, you'd, mic list you'd expect to receive two or three spots per section, it's kind of what I'd do. Depending on the studio, obviously they're dry or ambient, depending on you know, where in the world it is. Uh, this here is a second pass, some overdubs, and then we've got at the bottom here a um, cello solo as well. Let's talk first of all um, then about stems. For those of you don't, who don't know what stems are, let me introduce that to you and tell you why you should be using stems. Stems are basically ways of delivering the music to the post-production people so that your mix can stay as integrated and hopefully not touched as possible, but giving them the option to uh, rebalance it should they need to, or more importantly, actually re-edit it should they change the picture, which is actually more what happens these days. I don't know a, any show, TV, film, uh, computer games different, but uh, film and TV where um, a lock you're given by um, production is not a lock anymore. That, the word lock should be erased from the English dictionary. I work on projects where you are 
you know, they say they want delivery on Monday, and then on Sunday you get a call saying they've made, they've taken three seconds out here, a couple of frames out here. And so if you've got a, 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 an important piece of music that needs to hit a couple of places, then if you're, not in, if you're on top of something else and you've got a music editor, then that music editor needs um, a way of being able to keep your music and your mix as real as, real as possible and as, as how you intend it to do. And if you've got stems, then they, obviously they can remix that. And then there's the unforeseen thing of um, dialogue. You know, if there's a, a, a bit of dialogue, or there's a voiceover, and you've got your really important um, solo that's happening when they've decided to add a voiceover. If they don't have the control of the, of the, of the element, then you can, they can duck that down, but then keep the rest of your mix sounding good. You might ask then, so how do you deliver stems without spending your entire life bouncing out the stems. Well, that's the important, that's just, here's, here's where an important mix template starts, and this is what we'll talk about. But essentially what you want to do, for every stem you want to have, you want to have a set of reverbs, uh, delays, sound effects, some mastering, uh, mastering in the very kind of loose sense of the word, so like compressor, e compressor EQ for each of those stems. And then to make the best, um, for certainly for, for uh, soundtracks, is to then have a way of summing those together so that um, the full mix is the full mix with a, a, the, so the composite of those seven stems, so that, or 10, or X number of stems, so that when it goes to the mix, if they don't need to use your stems, fantastic. So if you've delivered 20 cues um, and they need to, uh, need to use the stems on one, then that's fine. But what I don't tend to do is do a final mastering. Um, because that's kind of done essentially, either if it's got a soundtrack release, uh, physical release, or you know, for iTunes, I mean, then that will get done by a mastering engineer. But um, I don't um, advocate putting a, um, a, a compressor across the, the, the end final mix because then the stems do not make that up. So you, you make um, basically all your stems sum to make the, the mix. So how do we do that? Well, if we scroll further down my blank session, has, this has at the bottom my um, starting template. Um, so you can see we have reverbs, lots of reverbs. We have 14 reverbs. So for each stem, I start with two reverbs. So this is the, these are the reverbs for uh, stem one. I have uh, an alto verb. For anybody who's seen any of my other videos I've done for Split4 Audio, um, I, we talk about reverbs quite a lot. I'm a fan of this reverb. And so what I'll do for each stem, I'll have instances of the same reverb. I'll start with this and then um, tweak it if I need to. And then I also have a secondary reverb for each stem. Uh, I'm using uh, an exponential audio uh, reverb here, but again, it can be anything. It can be, you know, your favorite reverb. I'm not an engineer who says you have to have a certain plugin to make, you know, the best sounding mix. You use what you, you know, what you have, what you can afford, and what you think sounds good to you. You know, the, the rules, there are no rules, let's be honest, apart from the kind of, the, the basic rules of making sure it's not clipping and distorting. Apart from that, do what you think sounds cool. So I have seven stems with reverbs. I then have um, a basic setup for um, a delay for each um, stem, so you can see them here. And then I also have my master for each stem. So this is where, I, if I wanna, I wanna add a, compressor and EQ. I can do that across each mastering stem. And then I have these um, record tracks that are used to uh, sum the stems together. Now let me put this in a slightly easier way of seeing it. I have designed, oh, it's, um, I've put this neatly on a, look at that, blimey, I did some preparation. And for those who don't know Pro Tools, this will work for Logic and for any other door, but this is essentially how I um, sum stems together so you get a kind of visual without it because it doesn't make much sense when you're looking at the Pro Tools edit page. So you have your track, you have the reverb, you have the effects here. These send to one another uh, and then they join together uh, here, going through your master uh, track, which is this one here. They then go through this record bus. So you can see the stem input is, comes from each of these stems and then it goes to two places at once. So you can see here, I've got uh, double, t double ticks. Uh, for those of you who don't know how you do that, you add a control key uh, for Pro Tools, and you can send it to two places. So you've got it here. So you're sending your each stem 
to a, its own finished stem audio track uh, and then a full mix. And you can see that here at the top. Let me close this, excuse me. And so here at the top are my record tracks. So I always monitor through uh, the Pro Tools. I, I know then I've, what I'm listening to is the final process. So the only thing going to the output is uh, the full mix. Make sure there's none of the audio tracks going to the output. Um, otherwise, then obviously you're not going to make it onto the mix. Then to make life a bit easier, I then have a dummy output for all the stems so that um, I don't hear things twice. Uh, that's just, this is a dummy output that doesn't go. This is a dummy bus that doesn't go anywhere. Some engineers like to listen to the full mix and some engineers like to mute the full mix or have that go into the dummy output and listen to the stems. Because I um, sum my stems the way I do, you only listen to one of them. I tend to listen to the full mix because I've got a control over the volume um, there so that if I've got dialogue, which I don't have sadly in this, in this movie, but um, then I can have two faders here and have control of the dialogue and change the volume, which is nice. I always tend to have my session neat and tidy. It's a kind, of, kind of a bit of a funny thing to say, but try and see as much as you can, really. Don't have anything unnecessary on the screen. I like to have a little visual representation of the mix here, just so I can see my levels. And that's that, really. So let me show you how I do my template in my I.O. Um, so here is the uh, stem O1. So if you look at this again here, you can see this is the stem. So all these tracks feed to this, these reverbs, descends, delays, record. It's all relatively straightforward. So that when I want to send to a um, track, so here's a track, a new track, I choose the stem I want it to go to, one to seven. I then um, want to give it some uh, reverb. So I then choose the reverb. Yeah, so it's, it all goes, it's all nice and straightforward. So make sure everything's numbered, obviously, then you just know, if you look, I can, uh, the way I number it is done so that I can see uh, there's something going wrong here. There's a number two there, which means it's not on the stem. So it's just little, I've spent a lot of time thinking about, visually you can see, when I open up the mix project, rather than this blank one, you'll see that you want to be able to visually see if something's going to the wrong stem, because you don't want that phone call at... Um, Midnight saying, You've, um, we love it, but um, there's snare reverb all over the uh, orchestra. Um, you get that kind of groan in your belly as you have to go back through and change every 20 uh, mixes. That's essentially what I do. So I have um, all the kind of stems and stuff set up, and then um, that's the kind of basic starting point, and then we get to the mix. It's a bit daunting when you get a big mix like this, or when you're starting uh, with, as a composer with the end of the composition process. I would suggest, if you are a composer, that you take the time to get your composition finished and then get to the mix as a separate kind of thought, so to speak. I think it takes a di it's a different kind of mindset, I think. So try not to mix as you go along, unless, of course, dictated by uh, schedules or whatever, but it is a different way of thinking. And certainly, um, I find it is, when I work with composers, they like if they like to get me in as a se second set of ears, or if they have to do it themselves, they'll they'll say, you know, let's come and help me out for a day and leave it with me or the equi equivalent. Um, so here is here is a blank setup. One more thing I wanted to say was how I tend to work is I'll have a template and then work on that template and work on a mix through a project. Um, when I get to the next project, I'll essentially restart. This, the whole process again. So the first two or three mixes of a project always take me a lot longer, but I go into that knowing that I will speed up as I go down. Uh, and you'll see that as I explain what I'm doing. But what, what I like to do is have an audio track for each sound. So this is, of course, is the first mix of the project. So I have brass, one, two, three, four. Um, and I ask the people providing me with the audio to make sure they have a similar naming structure for all their audio. So if there's a new sound, it might go down as Brass 5. Now, I don't have Brass 5 on here, of course, but when I do Brass 5, I'll make a new track, and Brass 5 will be on there. And if there's not a Brass 4, then that's fine. I won't put Brass 5 on Brass 4. I'll put Brass 5 on Brass 5. And so those sounds, the template will get bigger and bigger. At the end of a session, I will delete all the audio, 
um, but keep all the tracks. And then do a save as, and then import into that version two of the template, or version two, the new audio. Essentially, I try and think of it as an, a, a mixing desk, so that you're essentially just replacing a new bit of tape on, on coming up the mixing desk. I try not to, where possible, change the starting values of the, the, the faders here. So you'll see that on here that I've got some clip gain, and that is how I tend to work with mixing, is on the edit page, so that I'll maybe do a few balances, and you can see there's a few here, and when I get down to the multi-track, it's set up, but then any rides is done via clip gain, so you're not having to um, doing rides on the fader, so that when you replace the new bit of tape, audio, the balance is set for you. So that makes that as you go through and once all this, you have all the sounds, if you have 10 new sounds, or 10 sounds that are the same as the 10 sounds you've used in a previous queue, the balance will be set, the sounds will be set, the amount of reverb will be set, and um, it's hopefully the compression levels will be set too. So you can literally just press go and you are, the balance is done, so you're actually just doing rides. And so you can end up doing a lot of mixing essentially very quick after, at that point. So it's a really kind of crucial way of setting up when you're on a multiple queue project that have the same sounds. So how do I go about doing a mix? Well, as we all know, it's relatively instinctive. Um, I've been doing this for 20 years. I know what, what things should sound like. I guess I'm lucky in my kind of head. I know what a balance should be. Do I do certain EQ things? Do I do certain dynamic things? No. What I think is really important, and this is where my style of differs particularly from a more uh, kind of rock and roll or let's just say, you know, commercial music, you know, commercial radio music um, mix, is that I don't go into pre preconceptions about having to do certain things with sounds, you know, taking sounds away or adding, adding frequencies or taking these away. My uh, ethos is that each sound should sound as good as it possibly can. So think of it, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're you know, a Michelin star chef who's cooking, you get the best ingredients, and then the, may, the, the way that your food tastes the best is because it's got all the best ingredients, and what you're doing is, you know, isn't that important to the final product, really. It's, you're using all the best things. So with that analogy, you take a sound, you make that sound sound as good as it possibly can, you give it the best reverb, you give it the best, um, you just make it sound really good. And then when you combine that with all the other instruments, it's amazing that actually then the mix sounds good because yes, you may need to go then and, and then change a few things. You may need to, if there's too much percussion, bottom end, then fine, go through and, and, and start to do that. But it's amazing actually how well a mix works if you literally do just make all the components it sounds a bit stupid, but make each individual component sound really good. And then when you add it together, that's when you can think about maybe changing the position of a few things so that you've got some a bit more space, a bit more width, or whatever. Um, so literally what I'll do, and again, this is probably difficult to, to hear from down there, is I will go through and solo each individual sound and um, listen to it. get an idea of what I like about the sound. Um, what I always like to do is work on the sound, getting the sound sounding good as I possibly can, dry, and then add reverb afterwards. So um, I might, it's impossible for me to hear this here, so I'll go through and do it on, um, well, my, I'll show you what I've done on these sounds on the mix in a minute, but, but just to show you what I do. So I might add um, my favorite EQ, um, I am, oh, hang on a sec. That's what I'm looking for, it should be there. Um, I'm a big fan of these um, uh, FabFilter EQs um, because you get a nice little visual representation. One mustn't cheat by looking at the, uh, the waveform, but it is very useful so if there's a pesky frequency in there, it just saves you a lot of time if you can see that frequency where it is to just be able to nab it or, you know, emphasize what might be missing from it. So I don't use it as a visual representation as a, you know, I don't mix with my eyes, but I use it to save time. 
Um, I'm asked to mix a lot of music in a, lot, in a very short amount of time. I'm often asked to mix between 20 and 30 minutes of music a day, so I need to be able to do this quickly. So all these things are done to make it quick. So uh, this sound from up here has got quite a nice uh, brightness, but not much body, so I might just add a little bit of a bottom end. And a lot of um, samples should come to you sounding good. Obviously, you know, obviously the Spitfire audio ones do that I record and mix, but everything else should be pretty close to how you want to sound. I often find that with modelled instruments, particularly strings can come across a bit abrasive, so I often take out a bit of kind of high mids, as you'll see. Each, each sound, I still li like to listen to each one, listen to it. Um, I tend not to put any uh, compression on uh, individual tracks, certainly tracks like brass and that kind of stuff, because I want it to be dynamic as if it's been played by real people. Uh, once that's done, I'll then add a reverb. Um, I'll choose the reverb, so this is stem five, so uh, this is my first reverb. And you must ask, why do I have two reverbs? Well, I found that if you have two reverbs, um, they can be similar, they can be slightly different. One could be a convolution, one can be um, uh, whatever, you know, whatever you want, really. Um, plates or... Um, but they, if you have two, they combine in a way that one reverb doesn't, and it just sounds more realistic, a more realistic space. I think you're getting just, I think, guess the way the ear draws with one reverb. Just doesn't, it just sounds like a reverb, so um, just choose your two favourites, combine them, and I think you'll end up with it even better. It can be two from the same company, it can be two or two separate ones. I tend to use two separate ones to give myself different. Maybe one's got a slightly brighter tail, and one's got maybe one's got a slightly darker, slightly longer. But it really depends on the kind of mood. I, have a, I guess I have one that I always go to. My alto verb is generally where I start, but then I, depending on how I'm feeling, I'll add a, the second one. But it'll always be two, and I'll make sure that they obviously sound good by themselves first, and then combine them. Um, so let's hear what one reverb sounds like, and then when I add two, what that sounds like. Um, let me add my second one. Um, there it is. Um. So again, you can hear it there. That is. And then, um, if you then combine the two, it just helps to make it a bit more realistic. So this project, this process, goes on and on and on. Each, each listen to each sound. You can once you know you've got the levels, you can drag and drag and drop them, which is quicker. Newer versions of Pro Tools um, have this great new feature. Um, this is an old version of Pro Tools. I think this is like 12.8.2 or something. But the new um, 2018 versions um, have this great thing. It's called Recall uh, Track Presets, which is, comes up on this window here. And basically, you can set up all your sends on that particular stem. And so you can throw up the reverbs and your uh, effects right there. It's a really handy, quick way of bringing it all, recall it up, it's got the levels, it's got all the right sends for each stem, and that saves me a bunch of time. Here I go through, let's listen to some percussion. So what might I do? Uh, okay, so I tend to, um, tend to like using, a, again, just a bit more, there's a bit more, a bit more crispness to it, so I'll do that, I might change the cue. But again, a lot with most sample instruments, you don't need to do much apart from just give them a little tweak here and there. I don't like to, you know, do more than three or four dB of EQ, anything to EQ, because it shouldn't need much more than that, if anything. Um, I do like sometimes to use um, a bit of um, distortion, a little bit of subtle distortion on um, percussion. Uh, something like this little sound toy, little radiator is great. Um, make sure the noise is switched off. But this adds a little bit of just kind of bite and excitement to percussion, particularly when you've got a, you know, a big mix like this. Just. Uh, 
yes, it makes it a bit louder, but it also gives it just that little bit more excitement and edge. It's a really good little tip that for um, just making kind of making the mix, making your percussion kind of stand out. You can use this little radiator. Um, you can use um, this is uh, there's a great little uh, fab filter one. Um, Saturn is great um, for that. Again, it's got a kind of similar kind of drive feature. You've got some, you know, some things you can go crazy with it. Um, and then you've got this nice little tone wheel, which is really nice tone adjustments, which is a nice kind of little EQ, crude EQ. But again, this gives you some nice, um, nice sounds. Again, let's add some um, reverbs to those. Now I've got the sound I like. So we go through. Um, again, all, you can see all these other bits and bobs. We'll talk about that when I go to my other session. So then, how do you deal with... I'll talk about this quickly because not everyone will have this, but it's important. How do you deal with recordings that you've been sent or your own recordings, big multi-track recordings like this? You've been sent a big, a big string section for your, you know, you've forked out for some big recording. Here it is. You're mixing it yourself. How do you make this sound good? Um, you might get sent the board mix from the uh, recording session. I'd be tempted to not use that because it doesn't give you, you know, they're, they're doing it in a rush. Um, I'm guilty myself of when, when you're doing a board mix, at the recording side of things, you're listening to in a, you're listening in a different ba you're listening in a different balance. You're listening with the close mics louder or softer than you would do to, because you're listening to make sure that everything's technically getting recorded right. Um, so how do you do this with stems? Uh, you can do it the kind of way of selecting. Okay, right, let's put this all to stem one, and then um, you can then go through each stem. But what I've tended to do more recently um, is to use uh, the track feature and another a, a bus feature in Pro Tools which is really handy, um, and I'll explain why as I, as I do it. So if I've got each, so basically each set of recordings I send to a new bus, um, or a new track, as it's called it here. So I record, so I call this um, string, strings one, no, strings one. And then uh, this now is now called strings one, you can see. Make sure you say or isolate that, um, put that above and below. And now, so all of these are going to that new strings one. This then becomes our send to stem one. Uh, we'll end up putting our uh, reverbs on here. Um, there's stem one reverb, stem two reverb. Um, and there we go. And then you do your, you know, you go through and you pan, you know, you do your, wrong way around, I just thought the mix at the top. Uh, you go through and do your panning. Um, when you get, if you get something sound like this, then the left, the tree, the left, center, right, always goes left, center, right. If you're mixing in surround, then the surrounds go to the left and right. It's around left and right, but essentially it's, um, I, know, I know through experience that that's straight like that, and then I know where the uh, orchestra are laid out, so I'll uh, pan these accordingly. Again, it's really important that these are laid out as the, um, as the microphones were set up in the room. Um, diff, not quite, you can tweak it if you're doing the, uh, the, the solo stuff, but for, for, an, for a multi-track recording like this, the, the um, the, the panning is important to as, as they were in the room. So, again, the same rules apply. Um, listen, listen, to each, uh, listen to each recording in, in isolation. And then, um, again, I, for something like this, I try not to um, EQ this too much. I, I trust that the engineer has chosen the right microphone for it, and then I use it as a, a balance. So I'll go through, check it sounding OK. Um, Make sure they're balanced against each other. I don't worry about taking the kind of bass out of the violin mics because it ends up, you end up affecting the actual sound of the thing you're trying to listen to. You know, if you take out too much bottom end, if you went through and go, well, I want to hear the first violins, then it just, it just doesn't, for me, it doesn't work because you end up with a sound that's not as good as it could be. Um, I'll go through and do that. I then will balance, you know, go through and listen to the tree. Make sure the balance between left and right is good. Um, from here, I can't tell because I can't see it. But um, we can 
you'll see on the meter, it's maybe a little bit heavy. So here, what I like to try and do is keep um, my left and right levels here at zero, because you then know if there's something wrong in the mix. So if, it's, if, you do need, if there's been a slight discrepancy in a recording, I'll just put a um, trim on rather than, rather than change this level. I'll try and make it at zero, and I'll do the trim there um, so that the fader levels look right. I, imagine, again, imagining it's on a mixing desk, but you can see that there's the, both faders are around where you want them to be. And then I'll balance in the uh, surrounds. So the amb ambience, or outriggers, big button. Again, come up with the level I like. Check it against him, check it against the tree, etc., etc. Now, um, then I'll add my reverb sends to this actual track here. Um, let's just just say I've done my balances here, sorry, just so quickly. Um, imagine this is all ba nicely balanced now. Um, I don't put the sends on the individual tracks here because I always, I always put them um, post-fade anyway. Um, they're all post-fade and um, also they are going to be done um, post-pan um, as well. So that, this is a useful little button to have in. Um, so basically, the, the, the mix of the level I've got of, of, of here now goes to my um, reverbs. I guess probably it won't be very well mixed, of course, balanced, but again, I'll show you on the other session. And um, this is now my level. So that basically, if you... So if you want to change the reverb, you just have to do it here. If you want to change a little bit more, a little bit less, you do it here. Let's say you want to do something to the whole, um, I might, sorry, I'll go back a second. If I, if I want to put an EQ on each of these, I might, I'll do it here. Um, you know, whether that be a, you know, whether it's, if you only have the, uh, the basic plugins, you can do that here as well, you know, whatever. The reason I have this, this track thing we talked about before is so that if I want to do an effect to the orchestral stem, or not the orchestral stem, the orchest this orchestral recording, I can do it on the orchestral, that individual element. So for this mix, I might have these two stem, these two different recordings going to the same stem, but I only want to do an effect on um, the top one. So maybe um, whatever it might be, I might want more reverb, or I might want to you know, do, do a big kind of weird EQ effect um, if it's, um, you know, t take the bottom end out for whatever reason for, for a few bit. I can automate it here. I'm only having to do it on this master, essentially, for this recording. Um, I've, I hope I've explained that well enough. You'll see what I mean. Um, but if you're doing a multiple queue project, and the, you know, there's, let's just say, this is a good example, let's say this recording, this second recording has is some harmonics, and you, you want to just pull out all the bottom end and just have it really wispy and really kind of long reverb, you can just do that at this point on, on, at this stage without having to do it on individual tracks or anything else. And it just gives you much more control to do kind of cool mixing things um, much more quickly. Um, let me show you how this mix worked in real life and what I've done. So uh, thank you to you as well. Um, excuse me while this just loads. Um, so this project, initially, um, for, for this um, uh, client, I, I mix it in a slightly different way because I'm mixing uh, remotely from them and then I'm sending it back to them with their plugins in. So before the project, we talk about which plugins they're allowed to use, which they have at their system, because then they, um, for those that don't know computer games, there's a lot of issues with um, how you loop it and how what you want where. So um, for the mix I've done to for you guys today, I've used different plugins because um, I was kind of, the, 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 the original mix I did was much more tightly controlled of the amount of plugins I could use. Um, I've gone a bit more crazy here um, and used some favorite ones. But it's, just, it's, it's the same thing, you can see here, here we go. Um, my mix tracks, um, here's the video. Here's the demo mix, this is a really important thing to have. If you're mixing for somebody else, make sure you get a demo of where their mix is at just so you know you can make yours sound better. <laughs> There's no point um, 
getting a mix from somebody and thinking, this is sounding really good, and then you listen to their demo mix, and you're like, actually, their mix is pretty good. You know, but you need to know it sounds better. It might just be a case of volume, but you know, you, it's, good, really, it's important to have what they've been listening to. Um, also, uh, you know, more importantly, the balance. You, you know, something you've been given might have maybe, may, the balance may be wrong for whatever reason, when they've bounced something out with a plug-in on or off, and it might be three or four, three or four dB too loud, which then makes the mix obviously far too loud um, in your mix without you kind of knowing. So having that reference is really, really key um, for those two kind of key issues. Um, so here we go. You can see what I've, I've gone through each. Here's all the different stems. You can see here now where my numbering system is important because I can, you can see here, I've the, here I have um, strings, solo strings. I've written down what's on each stem. Why I haven't put anything on number three, I don't know. Uh, percussion, brass, ethnic, else. Ah, oh, three is the is the uh, yeah, is uh, choir. There you go. So I can easily see what I often have that on a bit of paper in front of me, so that I can uh, or my you know on my iPad or whatever, um, so that I can see um, what that stem is easily. So if I've got a new sound, I can just go straight to it. But you can see here that um, each all each of these stems is really easily obvious. Here it is. Um, let's have a look as to what some of the what I've done to some of these sounds. Um, Again, so here's a percussion. Uh, let's see what I did in the end. Um, this, there is my little, little radiator and an EQ. Um, see. Uh, three verbs working away. Uh, let's just go through a few, few of these sounds. Um, uh, let's look at some of the more interesting ones. Um, these pipes are quite interesting. Um, Again, I've got a, got a fair amount of EQ on this um, for me. Uh, okay, just a bit of brightness, um, overall brightness, and a bit of um, presence, and a bit of take away some of the kind of honkiness of, a, of the, uh, the pipes. Um, here you can see, here's my uh, delay, um, um, a little bit of these delay. I've got the same, same reverbs, like similar kind of sounds, but here's my delay. I like to use a delay not so you necessarily hear it, but as an extra reverb as such. It's there to throw something um, interesting into the mix. Um, if we just listen to it without the reverbs on. Um, you'll see what I mean. Here is this, here's my delay. The sound toys, uh, I'm not saying this because they're in the room, but the sound toys are a really great bunch of plugins to start with. Um, Echo Boy is fantastic. Uh, Decapitator is useful. Um, radiators, all these little things are just nice for little kind of things. But the Echo Boy is what I use on all my mixes. Each of my mix has an Echo Boy in it somewhere on the, on the stems. If I'm doing a surround mix, I'll have one Echo Boy in the front and the back. Um, I just find they really help to just make just the mix sound a bit kind of interesting. And it just makes, particularly if you've got a drone or something, it just gives it a bit of movement. Um, I haven't got anything here on this particular mix, but let's say I'm doing um, a, a score that's got um, a pad in it, they can quickly become quite the same. -y. And if you've got a delay in them, they just, it just helps to make it move a bit, particularly if they're quite kind of mono in stuff. If you have this, if you have a ping pong delay, which is what I've got here, this means it sends the signal to the left and right. It gives it that kind of sense of it moving. Um, it really works. Let's hear what it's doing to the pipes. Um, I think maybe it's where I'm sitting, I can't hear it, but... Um. There you go, it's just, you hear it there. So it's quite subtle there, but when you have it in the mix... Um, you know, it's not one of these kind of delays. You don't, you're not there to be heard. It's just there to just give it a sense of movement and and uh, a sense of like a reverb. So that when you combine it all together with the reverbs, it's just got a bit more feel to it. Um, let's have a look what else we've got. Um, probably something does something with the flute. It's got a commonish kind of sound in films. This style of stuff you've got again. You can see that I've taken used the uh, this. To just take a little bit of this out, and again, a bit of brightness. 
bit of presence. And then how did I do my, um, again, you've got this, the quite, so here you can see the use of my, um, my little tracks. I've got each of these tracks set up. Uh, they've got, here I've actually used a compressor on the, on the, on the choir. Um, Compression, how much compression do I use? Not much, really. A bit just to control it. Again, this, what I'm trying to do is make a mix that is realistic. And of course, if you're, you know, if you need to obviously control dynamics. Um, but if you're to make a good mix, if you have a good balance, and a, you know, that's maintained by having re realism, I think. So again, it's a tiny bit of, look at the, how much compression is going on here. You'll see not much of the game So not much. Here's the... So this, is, this is a classic double track. And again, my, having my little um, tracks here is a really useful way of saving time. So let's say, you, I know this here is a double track, but sometimes on different cues, one might not be a double track. Double tracks obviously sound really nice if you cross pan them. Um, so I can just do my cross pan here. Like you can see my left and right have, have been reversed here. So the right is going to the left. If you need to, for whatever, swap that over, you can easily do that quickly here. And that's, rather than having to do it on 20 or 30 tracks, you can just do it there. Nice, quick, easy uh, space time saver. Um, here, here's, so here, you can see the balance I've done with the reverbs, the, the balance and the, beg your pardon, not reverbs, uh, balance and a few EQs. Again, not much going on there. You can hear this orchestra now has sounds mixed. So it's a kind of nice sounding, again, uh, do I have uh, a compressor on, on this? Yes, I do. I've got a little subtle compressor. Let's have a look what I've done here. Um, this is the UAD. Uh, I, I have a UAD box. I use it sometimes. I use, I use them sometimes. They, um, this particular EQ, uh, compressor, I beg your pardon, I, I love. It's the one we have in the studio air. Um, it sits in the box, and it just... What it does, it adds a lovely warmth, and it's just a really great for a mix. So if you can, um, if you do have the, the the money to invest in a, a compressor, then I would suggest this one. It's a really nice for for orchestral music. It's very smooth, and again, you'll see not much. Um <laughs> in fact, virtually none. But you'll see what it does to the sound is quite nice. It just adds a kind of just something to it. Again, I'm not compressing too much at this stage. I'll show you the masters in a sec, and where I'm doing a bit more mastering, a bit more um, compression there. So I'm going through my mix. I've done all. I've done. I've done all my sounds. I'm then getting a balance. So once I've got all my sounds, I've gone through. I've done my make each sound sound as good as I can. I'll then do a first pass balance. So I won't do any automation at that stage. I'll listen through to it and uh, tweak to the individual clip gain. So I'll just I'll, I'll play it through. I'll show you what I, what I would do. There, are, there is some automation on this because it's a finished mix, but you'll get an idea of what I like to do. So um, I'll play it from the top. I might solo something as I go along. Just tweak it up. That's kind of could be cool. I want a bit more of that sound. Check the, check the balance of um, individual, individual elements of the percussion, for example.
that I'm using um, clip gain a lot. I find it really, really helpful. I just select the order and then just scroll, you know, scroll up and down the dynamics. It's just a really quick way of getting the balance uh, nice and easy. So I'll go through that two or three times, uh, getting the balance. I might use the faders sometimes if I know it's a sound that's going to repeat and I know I can get my starting balance good. And then I'll go through and listen. You can see why I've started to do this. So you can see I've made cuts and uh, tweaked the levels. So again, I'm not. I don't tend to use the mix page at all these days. I'm doing it all in clip gain, so that I'm doing it as fast as I can. I'm look, I'm, I've got the visual cue of where I am in the mix. I can see what I want to see. I'm not one of these engineers. I like to have the colors for the groups so I can see stuff. So I know it makes it a bit boring when you have all these black and white tracks, but it just means you know, know what you're, what's, what's going with other, other things. Uh, but you go, you go through and listen just listen to something where it might be there, why not, might not be, go through. And if I want to do a ride, then yeah, I might sometimes go down to have this, this, this feature and, and use that. What I tend to do is once I balance the section is use VCAs. Um, again, so here I've got some VCAs set up here for all these, all these synth tracks that are on a big group. So basically make, put them all in a group and then um, make, a, make, make the group make choose the, that group here in this, then switch the group off, but then I've got a control, so if I actually want to listen to all the pre-records, I can do that. Again, same with all the strings. So I've got my, I can just do some rides here again. You can see I've done some rides with the choir here. And this means you can just do things more quickly. But if I need to go ahead and do a, a, a ride uh, or a, a fade in the orchestra, let's just say, you can see I've done one here. What I tend to do is kind of cheat and so make a cut in the audio where I want to go. So let's say I have a section I want to be louder. Let's say I want to make this section louder. I'll highlight a bar. I want to make it be louder. Cut that. Um, tweak up that. I want that by 2 dB. And then this here is a sneaky way of doing a fade. So this then becomes my fade. So I'm crossfading between the, 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 the uh, clips. Um, and the, the only thing that's fading is the level. So it, as it goes across between these two points, it's going from minus four to minus two. And so there is my, um, there is my, there is my fade. So it's not doing a crossfade, it's just doing a, a volume crossfade. Um, again, so then it also means you can change the length of that fade very, very, oh, wrong one, wrong one, very, very quickly. So, okay, that's my fade now. That's, that's, that's taken too, too long, so you just adjust the length of the fade. You can use the tool if you like, or you can you know, you learn the shortcuts. And so I'm flying around doing these little edits as I'm going, and it's just making the whole thing speed up. Um. So I've got a basic balance. I haven't really looked at the picture at all yet. I've got my balance. I've started to do a few rides here and there. When do I put the master? the master compressor and EQ on each bus. I, at this stage, before I start doing rides, I guess, um, I've got my balance, I then put this on. I need to check out how, la how loud I am. So what do I put on across each mix? Well, I put a little, I put a gentle compressor across each, each particular stem and an EQ. I'm using this nice little Kush uh, one here. Um, bit of top end. Um, again, not, nothing, I'm not ever doing anything too crazy, unless it's a particular sound that really needs it. Um, and then each of these has uh, the same, doesn't have to have the same at all, of course, you can have whatever you like on each one. I tend to start with the same and then we'll adjust it. Um, and then these will be doing a slight more, probably like if you look at the percussion one, these are doing a bit more work at this stage. Um. <laughs> Anyway, um, doesn't look like it's working, does it? But that should be working. It was going that that was um, going down about two or three dB in gain. So um, I don't know why that's not registering, but um, perhaps we'll get our guy from UAD to come and uh, have a look. But, <laughs> but it, it was. Oh, it is. It's, uh, the threshold is quite high. I'm not quite sure why. It must be different. It's, it's different to how I had it in the mix, but. Um, but <laughs> I'd never 
tend to gain reduce more than about um, uh, three or never go past the four dB for this. For this style of music, it's not you'd never want to go that that far, I don't think. So that's that's that. Um, and then so then why do I have that I've got some level issues here? So of course when you add things together because you haven't got necessarily a um, a full mix as such, or full mix is being made about these these seven elements. How do you control levels? Well, you want to try and make sure that your balance is about, is about right, but sometimes when you add them together, they're going to be louder. So you want to be able to turn it up and down. Um, I try not to go turn it down too much. I try and do that up on the multi-track, but sometimes, you know, needs must. Um, so I might just t turn it down here, and I've got control here. Um, again, if you've got a particularly quiet cue, you can turn it up here, and you suddenly your mix is, is much louder. Um, but then also, if you need to do a ride for whatever reason around dialogue across the whole mix, you can do that here at this stage on these faders, which is great. So um, if, you wanna, if you wanna just bring the whole mix down for a certain section, you can do that here and, and, and do that, which is a very nice way of doing it. Now let's say, why, why do I have these rec tracks? Cause some people would do it from a, would, would, not, would not do it this way. I like to have this here so that it's going to two places at once here rather than have it going off a send to the full mix. Some people might put it here as a full mix. Um, I find this always gets over the delay compensation issue is if you have the send, if you have the master going from here to the two places, you have a level control here. But also, if, if after doing all this kind of rides around the dialogue or whatever reason you might need to do that for effect, if you want to make sure the end of your um, mix is louder than the front for whatever reason to give it impact. Um, here, you, you can, you've got another way of controlling the levels. If you make a group of all these, um, then you can, um, you know, you can then bring everything, bring the whole mix up so that you're getting a good level to, to the full mix. There you go. It's, you know, it's a nice, it just gives you another level control, which is quite neat for, for when you're trying to do a mix like I'm doing a lot where, you, where you're not, also, you're not trying to always slam it into, you know, to minus one or whatever. You're, it's dynamic, so it will go from... This, this project, for example, has quite a lot of quiet cues, uh, much like the front of this, and you want to be able to give it a decent level um, through to them. You can then just adjust the, the gain there. You might want to... I'll just show you what I do. If, if for, say, for example, you want to have, for your own records, a, um, a full mix that is, you know, is a mastered mix. Um, how would you do that at this stage? Well, it's quite simple, really. You can add just another... You, you have a full mix bus already going to the full mix. So if you want to add a, um, a new, another master to, have, to give yourself a great sounding stereo mix for whatever purpose, if you want to put it out yourself or, you know, in a sound cloud or whatever, if, you're, if you just make a new... Um, it's going to make a new um, stereo... But you, the, the bus is here. You can do it two different ways here. But we know we've got our full mix here. As our full mix, we wanted to go to a new uh, new track, like a new bus. This is our uh, mastered mix. There it is. Uh, that needs to go to a new bus. So we need to go to I/O quick. And uh, I think I'm not done this. I'm not. Um, four. CD. Um, I've done this right. And then it, that's for the CD. And then so we, now we can add. So here's our new stand. We can then make a new audio track at the top here. Um, sorry, this keyboard's different to, to the British one. Um, then there's our. So we've got this. And we can now listen to the two versions. But we've got our. Um, Mix and then we can put our you know classic classic mastering um, across here. So um, I'm not sure I've, I've given myself an extra. I think I'll give myself an extra aux here in the haste of doing this. But you can I don't you know, I don't need both these uh, these tracks. But you'll see. Um, as we go through, I can put my um, mastering. Um, um, let's just use a straightforward head limiter, and I can get my. Uh, yeah, there we go. So um, I've now got my, I've got my, I've got my um, limiter here, and I can just. So you can see that I've got now. I've got this. This is here. 
So you've got a, basically you've got a full mix that you want for yourself. Again, never deliver this. I wouldn't deliver this. This is for your personal preference here. But it's, you've got that should you want to have a mix for whatever purpose. I think that's kind of as much as I can say that makes sense from this, really. There's a few kind of tips uh, here. When you're doing a, a project like this, try to always monitor at the same volume throughout the day where you can, or have your monitor set up at the same level. The reason I have this here is that I tend to have my level controller set at the level I like to have it at. And then if I need to change the volume, I'll do it, I'll do it here. If you want to listen to how, how the mix sounds quiet, you've got that there. Um, if you want to listen quietly for a bit to give your ears a break, do it there. So that you know that when you have dialogue or you've, then you know your dynamics, you've got, you've got a reference to how loud actually loud, kind of loud is. Um, so I think that's quite a, a neat way of doing that. If you've got samples only, there's a few things you should really watch out for. Make sure that they just sound, make sure they sound as real as possible. So, you know, if, you've, if you don't know what an instrument sounds like, listen to it in context, YouTube, and listen to an instrument. But also how these instruments end their notes. Like, a lot of samples are bad because, you know, if you're playing, if you're saying to a, a string, string orchestra, play a, a note, then they see it last two bars long, they will automatically give it some dynamic. Obviously, a sample can't do that because it doesn't know how long it is, you know. For the way we record samples is we record them for like a long note for like nine seconds and that's looped if it needs to be longer um, or shorter. It's obviously, it's shorter, so it's done a release. There's, there's, no, there's never any shape to a, a long note in an example, so give it shape. Make sure that you fade it out with your expression or with audio if you need to. Um, and then also make sure that you know, to make this, to make a uh, a, a sample instrument sound real is make sure that there's no loud velocities in the middle of a, of a, of a, of a run or you know, a, a melody, for example. Something like a harp, for example. They're very you know, they're delicate things, and, a, and, a, and a, a pro harpist will play the same velocity uh, across a melody. You know. There won't be, with samples, of course, if you go one or two, one or two, deep, uh, one or two MIDI um, expression levels above, and it starts the next sample layer, it obviously has got much more attack. And that's, the sh that's for me, is the, the surefire way of knowing it's a sample if you hear that loud pluck of a, of a harp in the middle of a melody that's completely wrong sound. So make sure that you either catch that at the, at the kind of velocity stage, or when you're playing, if you, let's, I, 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 these actually are really, really well programmed uh, samples here. But um, let's just see if I can find something where that might be um, not the case. I probably can't find anything now. Um, let's just listen to this flute and see if it's got it somewhere. But um, so that, that little that little note there, for example, that little pickup, it's a bit soft. So you know you can hear from there. That's not, that, that, the musician would never play that. So let's just so if you need to fix it post um, velocity, again it's done. I just do it with a clip gain. So I just need to just t turn up that note. Again, it looks like I'm doing something that's quite radical, but actually by the time you put the fade in, um, it works nicely. You can see there it gives it a real, like you actually want to pick that up, so I'm just going to move that whole, there we go, move that whole fade a bit earlier. But a bit too much, but I can just drag that back now, and, and that sounds a bit more, that sounds more realistic. So that's quite a nice way of doing it. Yeah, as I say, end, end of notes, fade out, Fade out string notes that go on uh, too long. So look some longs. Here we go. That just don't sound. Again, it's well programmed. But some, for example, if, if if that wasn't well programmed, you can just snip the end off, and just do a little fade, and it just helps. Amazing, it's amazing. Those little those little tweaks do just just to really make it um, make it sound real. First of all, big round of applause for Jake Jackson. Also, a round of applause, Spitfire Audio. Thank you so much for making this possible.